When we hear the words disaster recovery, we often think about the big problems, the hurricanes, the fires, the tornadoes. The reality is there could certainly be big problems, but very often they're smaller problems as well. If a water pipe bursts in your facility and that pipe is going to damage systems that you might have in your data center, that becomes a bit of a security problem as well. It becomes a bit of a disaster that has to be recovered from. We will often manage these disaster recovery systems through a third party, or we'll include a third party through this. Maybe we will contract with a data center facility that sits there, and if we ever call a disaster, that data center will be available to us. And we can drive there. It's probably in a geographically diverse location in case there's something that happens over a large geographical area. We can go to a different city and bring up a disaster recovery data center in that different city. Generally, we call a disaster. Disaster has occurred, and there's a set of processes and procedures for calling that disaster. Because when you start the disaster recovery process, there's some costs that are associated with that. So we're dispatching people. At that point, everything goes into action. We look at our plan of attack. We've gone through all the things that we've been planning for, and now we're actually executing on it. We have to be able to think on our feet because when a disaster occurs, Things might happen that we would have never thought of. We may have uh, realized that we're going to need to have generators if we lose power, but we may not have realized that the power outage would be so massive that we would not be able to get gasoline for the generators because the gas stations don't have power to be able to pump the gasoline. So the, all of these things work together, and sometimes you have to think about, how am I going to get gasoline? How am I going to be able to pump some of these things out? Sometimes those unknown things can really bite you, and you have to be able to move and change as you go, especially in the middle of a disaster. Another thing to consider for business continuity is planning for succession. And this becomes an issue when you have people that are leading the company that in many cases are, are known to everybody within the company who leave the company, who pass away. These are challenges that may leave a vacuum in leadership or may have a financial impact to the organization. You never know what can happen. And when it does happen, it can be very, very sudden. If someone is dismissed, if somebody leaves the organization, they were here yesterday and now they're not here anymore. How do we handle that, maintain that our company and our organization continues to function? Sometimes there's a deputy in place. And a good idea for anybody in a management role is to have somebody who could step in for them. Ideally, as a manager, as a director, as a VP, you're training your replacement. So you should already perhaps even have an office, a deputy CEO or a deputy CIO that is a formal office of the organization. Should the CIO, the CEO step aside, you'll have somebody to take their place in relatively short order. There may also be travel restrictions, and this may be part of your entire policy for succession, is that if there are people that are leading our company that are traveling, maybe we make it so that only one of those people can be on a single flight, or maybe only two board members on a single flight. And that way, if something is to happen to an organization, it would have a limited effect on the total number of people involved.